Guys, if you have low free testosterone, you need to pay attention to this video. So this is Elliot from EO Nutrition, and today we're going to focus on one of the most overlooked and hidden causes for low testosterone, usually in males, and the chances are uh, practically no one even knows about it. So I'm speaking from experience in that I had to deal with this problem for years and I eventually found a solution for it. It also seems as though Dr. Paul Saladino, known as Carnivore MD, has also dealt with this similar kind of problem. And based on a comment that I made on one of his YouTube videos a couple of months ago, he seems to have also benefited from the same solution. So in this video, we're going to talk about what that solution actually is. So although your total testosterone may be normal or may even be high, which is actually quite common, the free portion is the portion which is bioavailable, which can act on tissue. So if you have low free testosterone, you can still develop symptoms of androgen deficiency despite having normal total levels. The most common reason for low free testosterone levels is elevated sex hormone binding globulin. For those who don't know, this is a protein which is produced mainly in the liver. It's pumped into the blood. And then when it's in the blood, it binds very tightly with testosterone. This renders it uh, not free, it reduces its bioavailability. For what it's worth, just so that you can see, my SHBG has been elevated for several years now. This was back in 2019. You can see it's in the red. 2020, I had it measured again, and we could see that it, it actually went up. It went up to 83, and it went back down, came back down to 58, but that's still much higher than I would like to see it. And what I can fortunately say now is the last time I had this checked, which was June 2022, you can see it's come back down, it's come down to 48, which is the best it's been in several years. Basically, uh, I found a way to bring down sex hormone binding globulin, and it's really simple. For what it's worth, there's several potential causes for elevated sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, let's just say that I had gone through many websites online, had looked at many of the risk factors, and I tried as many things as possible. Quite simply, none of it worked. The only way that I could find the solution that worked for me was by going directly to the scientific literature and reading through. It turned out that the solution which helped me bring down my levels was uh, fixing iron overload. So iron is one of those dietary minerals with a really high toxic potential if it's found in too high amounts or if the body can't process it really well. So men are much, there are much greater risk for iron accumulation or iron overload disorders simply because we don't menstruate, we don't lose iron. Uh, this is particularly relevant for males who eat uh, animal based or a diet which is very high in organ meat or red meat if they eat from cast iron pans or alternatively if you have any of the genetic uh, variations which might predispose you towards a hyperabsorption of iron, such as found in hemochromatosis. It's well known that uh, iron overload will lead to a progressive decline in testosterone, and this is thought to occur um, both at the level of the brain and the testes. So there's profound oxidative stress that leads to this kind of hyper-inflammatory environment where the testicles become damaged. They they literally lose the, the ability to make testosterone. There's lots of other stuff that goes on, but it's also known now that iron over overload in the liver can also elevate SHBG. It can be one of the things that causes um, unexplained high sex hormone binding globulin levels. This concept was also demonstrated in another case study of an individual who was presenting with erectile dysfunction, but he had normal, he actually had high testosterone levels. Uh, if we go down, then we see that this individual also had very high SHBG, uh, which is to be expected, and he had uh, significant markers of iron overload. In fact, if you look at his transferrin saturation, we come here and you see that his transferrin saturation was absolutely massive, 86%. His ferritin was above 1,000. His gamma GT, which is a marker of liver dysfunction, was 167. So this guy had progressed pretty far, and we see that there was definitely a correlation between sex hormone binding globulin and this overall um, tendency of the liver to accumulate iron. If we look at Paul Saladino's recent videos, we see that he also seemed to be ex experiencing something similar to this. Taking a look at his August 2022 blood work update, you see, I, I watched this a couple of months ago, and 
You see his total testosterone is on the high side for sure. Uh, it's in the 900s, very close to the reference range. But you see that his free testosterone percentage is, is pretty low. Let's see what he had to say about that. There is one piece of these hormones that continues to interest me that I'll talk about. You can see the free testosterone is 14.37 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, it's 1.59 percentage. I would like that to be a little higher. And I think that that is because my sex hormone binding globulin remains a little bit higher than I'd like to see it. You can see here the SHBG on this test was 97.5. Now, okay, so very high SHBG. Uh, that would help to explain the low free testosterone. But then we look at another part of his sec uh, section of his test. Uh, we see that the iron saturation is up at 42%, which is higher than I would like to see it personally. And then we also go back to a month prior and look at another test that he'd done. And you see that the iron saturation was all the way up at 54%. So this is kind of in the danger zone. It's a very similar pattern that I saw in myself. High total testosterone, low free uh, testosterone, high sex hormone binding globulin, along with high transferrin or iron saturation. So I actually went ahead and dropped a comment on his video and explained uh, my own situation, what I'd seen in my own clients and what I'd seen in myself. Fast forward a couple of months and we see that his most recent blood work update in December 2022. Right, so what we can see is a positive trend. We see that the total testosterone comes down, but that's really quite irrelevant because... What we also see is that the free testosterone goes up, the iron saturation coincidentally has gone down, and then if we look at the sex hormone binding globulin, well, that has also gone down significantly. Remember, it was up at 97, and it's gone down to 69. So let's listen to what Paul actually, how, how he managed to achieve this. And for the majority of the time since the last blood draw in August, I've actually been doing phlebotomy. So I've been going to a practitioner who will just take my blood and then we just give it to plants or throw it out. So essentially bleeding um, out of my vein. I'm doing about 200 cc's of blood every three to four weeks. Or um, if I can do it more regularly, I would probably aim for 50 to 60 cc's per week. Now, I don't have hemochromatosis, but if you look at my blood work, and I'll go back to that in a moment, my ferritin was creeping up, my iron saturation was creeping up, and my transfer and my transferrin saturation was creeping up. And hat tip to Elliot Overton, who made a comment on one of my YouTube videos and said, you should think about iron overload. I, th this is something where I've learned in the past few months, and it's why I wanted to share this with you guys. I never really thought that a ferritin of 250 or 300 was problematic for most humans, but I'm having to question that in my own mind now. And I think that if I continue doing phlebotomy and my SHBG continues to come down as I get rid of excess iron, then this may lend support for the hypothesis. Yeah, so this is exactly uh, what happened to me. It's exactly what I've seen on a clinical basis. So as I started donating blood, as I brought down my transferrin saturation levels, my sex hormone binding globulin levels followed quite nicely. And it seems to be uh, a very effective way to bring sex hormone binding globulin down if there is evidence of iron overload. The best way to check for evidence of iron overload, if you suspect that this might be a problem for you, is to look at your transferrin saturation. If you're in the US, you might be doing iron saturation, although transferrin saturation is the best marker. So many doctors will erroneously look at ferritin as the best marker for iron status. Ferritin doesn't become elevated until quite late into the disease. Uh, usually in the early stages, the best way to check is by looking at transferrin saturation. It's the earliest and most accurate marker. Now, this particular paper is saying if it's above 40%, 45%. If it's above 45%, then that's very good indication. One might even say that if it's above 40% or even a little bit higher than that, I personally know that I feel best if I have, um, I'm sitting between 30 and 35%. When I get above 40, that's when I know that's when my symptoms kind of start going downhill. So later on in that podcast, Paul discusses some of his genetics and he shows that he does have, he doesn't have any of the classical risk factors or the genetic predispositions for hemochromatosis, uh, at least the ones that are commonly known about. Interestingly, if you look at my 23andMe data, you see I've only got one variant. I'm heterozygous on the C282Y. Um, if you look at the research, this isn't technically or classically associated with iron overload or hemochromatosis, but we know that I, I actually do. Um, now, 
Paul doesn't have any of these variants. However, Chris Masterjohn makes an excellent point. There's lots of steps along the way that there can be uh, potential problems with iron homeostasis. So there could be several different genes and several different variants which have simply not been identified. The best way to really check is to look at your own blood work in real time. Just on this topic, I mean, what we do see is that people who shouldn't technically have iron overload with a similar genetic profile to me, so heterozygous C2A2Y, uh, they did develop, there's two cases of this. There's this one paper, and then there's another paper. And it's saying that there's kind of novel or rare HIV variants, which have not been studied, and which scientists really don't know to look out for. Indeed, another thing which is super interesting is that C2A2Y heterozygotes, so people with only one variant and who shouldn't technically have uh, hemochromatosis, there was a study which essentially showed that the C2A2Y polymorphism was associated with higher levels of sex hormone binding globulin in men who didn't even have iron overload. Now, um, I'd be interested to see how they were measuring that, like whether they were looking at transfer and saturation or whether they were looking at uh, any other different markers, but that is very interesting. I assume that because iron overload is associated with inflammation, because it's associated with oxidative stress, then that must be the thing that's in increasing the uh, the production of this protein in the liver. Uh, that is something that I'd read online somewhere, and that kind of made some sense to me. But when I looked into it, it doesn't seem as though that is really um, that could be explained by the evidence whatsoever, because it turns out that sex hormone binding globulin tends to be reduced under conditions of oxidative stress and inflammation. If we look, for instance, at um, obesity in metabolic syndrome, in PCOS, in other inflammatory conditions of the liver, you know, these kind of systemic inflammatory conditions are usually associated with lower sex hormone binding globulin. In fact, sex hormone binding globulin is associated with insulin sensitivity. As someone regains insulin sensitivity, sex hormone binding globulin improves, it increases. That makes me wonder, given that the body is innately intelligent, like why would it want to increase sex hormone binding globulin levels in the context of iron overload? Um, surely it must be beneficial in some way. Like what's, what purpose does it serve? And when I think about it, it's really quite obvious. This particular case study was looking at a case of hemochromatosis, which was unmasked by testosterone replacement therapy. He presented with erectile dysfunction. Um, so they gave him testosterone and what they found was that his red blood cells increased. He developed erythrocytosis. It's well known that people who take uh, testosterone replacement or anabolic steroids can um, develop high hematocrit, basically a thickness or higher viscosity of the blood. And in some cases, this can be uh, very, very, very dangerous. And so this is one of the reasons why people who do take anabolic steroids or do take testosterone generally need to um, measure their blood parameters because they can develop too many red blood cells. The blood can get too thick. Well, the same thing can happen with hemochromatosis. In fact, elevated hemoglobin, elevated hematocrit is quite common when it comes to people who have hemochromatosis. You see, if you have too much iron, then that, that can be a signal for erythropoiesis, which is basically um, the development and maturation of red blood cells. Testosterone can do the same thing. So when you add up the effect of high testosterone along with high iron, uh, that is potentially going to lead to a situation where you're producing too many red blood cells, hematocrit gets too high, your blood gets too thick, and you develop circulatory failure, right? So might it make sense, at least, if the body senses that there is some degree or the initial steps of iron overload, that it might adapt to that in a way as to reduce free testosterone levels so that you don't get the additional or the added effect of both extra iron and high testosterone on blood cell production? I don't know. That is something that immediately comes to mind, and it seems as though high sex hormone binding globulin may actually be somewhat protective, although we know that 
low testosterone or low free testosterone is not protective for males, it might be the case that the body has to choose between the two. And it says, okay, as long as I've got high iron, as long as I've got iron overload and I can't do anything with it, then I'm going to need to downregulate testosterone production um, or testosterone free testosterone bioavailability so that I can kind of do what I can with the best that I can kind of thing. Again, I think it's probably quite common in males, especially if people have the early stages of iron overload and they don't know that they've got it. So it's definitely something to work to look into. Um, and it can, it might be the solution for someone who does have um, chronically high levels of SHBG like I did, um, but can't find a solution for that. If you like this video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe, uh, share it far and wide. And if that's everything, see you next time.